want to establish dominance, then one of the best ways to do it would be through a demonstration of your power. Of course this comes from the world of cinema and television, and I'm not just talking about superheroes or supervillains. Our favourite characters have been doing this for ages and by now we've got a whole collection of scenes that prove my point. Here are my top 25 badass power demonstration scenes across film and TV. You know, I've always been one of those guys who says that anime doesn't need live-action adaptations. I mean, I was right for the most part with abominations like Death Note and Cowboy Bebop completely massacring the source material, but then came along One Piece which gave me some hope. Now, the latest craze is Yu Yu Hakusho, which is an adaptation of one of my favourite anime shows while growing up. Of course, I'll say that it's nowhere close to the original series, but the show had some amazing moments. And the highlight has got to be the final battle between Yusuke and younger Toguru. It's one of those typical fights where the hero struggles right till the very end, where he pulls out some kind of trump card, and in this case, the weapon of choice is Yusuke's famed spirit gun. I must say that the CGI here was pretty impressive and it really enhanced the impact of the spirit gun. Younger Toguru said it was when he confessed to never using so much power to counter an attack. Bro really thought he was Goku, collecting all that energy like it was Dragon Ball Z's trademark spirit bomb. What are you asking? If he fucked other women when he grew tired of you. How many bastards does he have running? <gasps> I did say that power demonstrations apply to all kinds of characters, so don't expect this to be an overdose of MCU and DC entries. Perhaps the best way to cover a topic like this is to understand what power really means. The best person to explain this is none other than Cersei Lannister, because that woman really knows how to flex her authority. Littlefinger spent the entirety of season one showing us how slight and witty he is, but to have all that knowledge reduced to nothing in the face of true power is exactly why people like Cersei will always be ahead of people like Peter Baelish. Knowledge is power. Seize him. Cut his throat. Stop. Power is power. Seeing such a usually composed character losing his call in the face of adversity was a nice little twist and it gave a very realistic idea of how the leaders of the world always reign supreme. I mean, you can study as many books as you want and have the lead in all the juicy gossip, but none of that's going to amount to anything if the Queen simply orders for your head to be chopped off. The cinematic symbolism of closing on the short of Littlefinger gazing at the person scrubbing the floor is so poignant. It shows how Cersei took him all the way down to nothing. Man, this is the kind of storytelling that made Game of Thrones amazing in the first place. Turn around. Close your eyes. Power is power. Do see if you can take some time away from your coins and your whores to locate the star girl for me. I would very much appreciate it. Us as a child, us in the future, and us as a, uh, an alligator. If Disney and Marvel always put the same amount of effort into their shows as they did in low-key, then Phase 4 of the MCU would have been a whole lot better than what we eventually got. Enough with the criticisms though, I'm here to talk about the God of Mischief and his knack for power demonstrations. In this case, we got to see not one, but three different Loki versions flexing their best skills. Classic Loki steals the show with the way he manages to create freaking Asgard in order to stall the Alioth. It really was a tremendous display that went on to show why the OG classics always come through. Then of course, we've got Loki and Sylvie doing their thing to enchant the Alioth just in the nick of time. It was a visually appealing effort that also highlighted some of the key themes of the show, primarily trust and alternation. It was a real shame to see the monster devour classic Loki, but the way he shouted glorious purpose gave me goosebumps when I first watched this episode. What really stood out to me was that classic Loki was trapped over here all this time, but he still remembered what his home planet looks like. Damn, I'm getting kind of emotional now. Not the girl! 
They say hell hath no fury like a woman scorned for a reason, you know. That logic holds even more significance if the woman in question has fire powers that can burn down anything in her path. 1984's Firestarter has gone on to become something of a cult hit, and I know a lot of people nowadays will find it hard to believe, but the young actress playing Charlie over here is Drew Barrymore. <laughs> it kind of makes you wonder if the character name had something to do with her casting in Charlie's Angels. <laughs> And that's kicking your ass. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that Charlie is out to seek revenge for what has happened to her father, so she destroys a whole warehouse without even the slightest bit of hesitation. On the one hand, it's horrible to see a young girl having to resort to such methods due to a traumatic experience, but on the other hand, the way she shows her firepower is truly commendable. I mean, just look at how much damage she deals here. It's not like Charlie's content with just one fire blast. She doesn't want to leave a single trace of her victims. A well-written, suspenseful, but somewhat dark and emotional powerhouse of a movie that stood the test of time is what this is. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Project Power was such a wasted opportunity by Netflix. They could have turned this concept into a legacy franchise, but I guess it just wasn't meant to be. Well, I like to focus on the positives, and in this case, it's the scene where Art finally unleashes his own power. Look, I know the name Pistol Shrimp isn't exactly the most badass term you'll hear from the protagonist, but it's actually a pretty deadly move. The power demonstration in itself is extremely destructive, and I think I've figured out how Art's skill works. Every single movement he makes has the power of the Pistol Shrimp. From his limbs, fingers, toes, voice, and even his freaking in heartbeat, these actions function at such a fast pace that they create a gigantic shock. The rain in this scene may have been an amplifier, but I personally think that he moves so fast that he can disrupt any environment that he's in. On top of that, I like the idea that R has the power to destroy everything in his path and his daughter has the power to bring things back to life, perfectly balanced as all things should be. Perfectly balanced as all things should be. Also, the pistol shrimp is an actual animal and also possibly amongst the most dangerous creatures on the planet, so do some research and you'll know what I mean. It always helps to see a power demonstration when the guy you're rooting for is struggling in the first half of the fight. 1985's The Last Dragon gave us exactly that when Leroy took on Shonuff in the final battle of the film. I like the way that they kept it in the dark alley because that suited the overall vibe of the movie. I know it's supposed to be like an action comedy, but believe me when I say this battle was a serious encounter. Of course, the takeaway moment is when Leroy glows with the power of the dragon and Shonuff figures he's the true master. Kudos to our hero for being able to flex his skills and also make sure his opponent didn't drown after he was beaten. Look, even though enough gets his butt handed to him. It was his initial dominance that really gave the scene its essence. In my opinion, when Leroy throws in all those punches at Shonuff, only to see him blocking them with just one hand, that's one of the best openings to a fight scene. Also, I want to shout out the part after the fight where Leroy stops a bullet by literally catching it in his mouth. Bro turned into Chuck Norris for a moment there. Alright, listen up. I'm not here to talk about how much logic there is to this scene because it was a highly debated topic when Rise of Skywalker was released. I mean, you could go to this video on YouTube right now and see the comments to figure out how much they messed up with the source material here. But having said that, this scene involves Rey in the middle of a tug of war battle with Kylo Ren and she unleashes a giant bolt of lightning that destroys a freaking spaceship like it's nothing.
Now, I'd be lying if I said I didn't find that cool, and I'd probably have placed it much higher up on my list if there wasn't so much controversy around it. The visuals in this scene were also nicely executed, and the main reason why the lightning strike is so impactful is because of the build-up towards it. Like, you've got the two most important characters of the rebooted franchise flexing on each other's force powers, and then Ray instantly shows her opponent that she's the boss, although blowing up that ship wasn't exactly the plan. Thank God they didn't take away Chewbacca from us, otherwise I would have walked out the cinema halls right there and then. Good evening, Rorschach. Dr. Manhattan. You know why I'm here. Yes. If I were to sit down and list all of Dr. Manhattan's powers, then it would probably take me a lifetime because Bro's abilities are limitless. He can teleport both himself and others, manipulate matter itself, modify his body size, separate his body, fuse his bodies, and God knows what else. However, the one power that I'd love to highlight is when he sits and creates the very construct of energy while simply striking one of the finest yoga poses that you'll ever see. What this scene establishes is that Dr. Manhattan is an endless being within himself, so the real power demonstration is from his side in the real world to our side in the real world. Bro must have felt invincible because how on earth can anyone even compete with a being who's so overpowered? I mean at this point he's basically the law of physics itself and can create as many powers as he wants. Imagine having this guy in the Snyder universe. That would have been such a cool inclusion. I'm actually surprised that that never happened because Zack Snyder is the one who directed Watchmen in the first place. Look at me, Jean. I can help you. Sam K. Jansen was a perfect casting for the role of Jean Grey, and she'll forever remain a classic character just like Hugh Jackman as Wolverine and Patrick Stewart as Professor X. Even though there are mixed opinions about the writing of The Last Stand in the movies in general, I most definitely love this scene. It shows how powerful Jean really is as the Phoenix, and what she can do when there's no holding back. She was annihilating everyone and everything in front of her eyes, which gave off massive Thanos vibes. Well, that technically means that she served as inspiration to the Mad Titan, but the point I'm trying to make here is Jean shows us some seriously devastating abilities, especially with the way she totally decimates the soldiers and creates a freaking tornado without even breaking a sweat. Sure, Sophie Turner also did whatever she could in the rebooted franchise, but there's only so much you can accomplish as a newbie. The expressions on Jean's face also gave us the kind of idea of the rage she was dealing with. Thank God for Wolverine and his healing powers, eh? I did kick things off with a decent live action remake and now we've got the show that might have changed the way people view the concept in the future. One Piece is the most popular anime show of all time, so to remake it in a Netflix series was definitely met with a lot of initial caution, however the end product was a respectable effort and I loved a lot of scenes from the show. One of these scenes was the final battle between Luffy and Arlong where our hero manages to pull off all kinds of gum gum moves to emerge the victor. Honestly, it takes some serious talent to say the words gum gum before an attack and not sound silly, so kudos to Inaki Godoy for nailing the role. The fight in itself was pretty neat, and I was particularly creeped out when Arlon grew his shark teeth. <laughs> But the best moment is when Luffy unleashes the battle axe to win the match. Not only was it impressive showcasing of his true powers, but the effect also really made us believe that Bro could turn his leg into an elongated axe that's capable of taking down a whole tower. Oh my God! Ah yes, it's he who must not be named in an entry that must definitely be appreciated. That scream from Voldemort was just unbelievable to hear in the theatres when the movie first released, because you didn't expect to hear that kind of demonic shriek from his character. This was the moment when things truly got serious. You can tell how powerful that spell was just by the shockwave it created when it struck the shield. Voldemort cast a strong enough spell to shatter a magic barrier that was created by several exceptionally powerful and skilled witches and wizards. On top of that, he broke through Hogwarts' latent protection spells from the original founders and 
made it possible without verbally casting the spell and used a wand that resisted him. I wonder how powerful that blast would have been if the wand didn't resist him, but yes, it's an exceptional display and deserves all the praise in the world. That transition from Ron and Hermione's joy to Voldemort's rage is one of the best moments of the Harry Potter films. It perfectly sums up Voldemort's character. Where love brings others joy, it brings him pain. <laughs> You don't expect to see Millie Bobby Brown on lists like these, but the TV region will always give credit where it's due. Stranger Things is one of those few shows that was able to bounce back from a disappointing season to come up with probably the best season of the entire series. Eleven has just managed to regain her powers, so she decides to give them a test ride on a chopper, and by that I mean she literally smashes it to the ground and even destroys the military base with it. Well, Arnold Schwarzenegger may not have enjoyed that because he kind of likes getting to the chopper. Of course, the main focus here is seeing Eleven using her powers again, but can I just say that watching her stand there without getting affected by the bullets being fired at her was a true mark of a badass. The intensity shown during this sequence was a great example of building a scene to a satisfying payoff, so I'm glad the Duffer brothers have grown as directors. All in all, this was a job well done, so Eleven better have gotten a lot of those Ego Waffles as a reward for her work here. You want what I have? You want to feel what I feel? Ah yes, it can't be a power demonstration video if we don't include this scene from X-Men Apocalypse. We all know how powerful Magneto is as a character, but I don't think Bro even knew his own strength. That's exactly why Apocalypse came to the rescue and helped him unlock his true potential at the same place that it all started. Now I want to highlight something that a lot of other people have also managed to figure out. Apocalypse didn't enhance Eric's power in the way he did with the other mutants. It's extremely important to note that the mutant god told him, you'll find you have the power to move the earth itself. Apocalypse knew how strong Magneto really was once he learned to turn his pain into anger, and when Eric finally taps into that power, the final result is terrifying and amazing at the same time. As expected, Michael Fassbender's performance really enhanced the scenes and makes us feel the same rage Magneto is experiencing as he destroys the Auschwitz camp with raw power. If him moving metal wasn't badass enough, Bro went ahead to control Rubble as well. Halle Berry lands her way into this list courtesy of my favourite power demonstration scene from Storm. I know it's expected of her to control the weather and stuff, but come on, you've got to show your appreciation to a girl who can summon tornadoes at will. The weapons in this heat. The tension in the scene was pretty obvious, so for Storm to be able to counter the enemy jets with such ease was a great way to show why you can't really mess around with her. Just remember that she's doing this while being seated in the X-Jet. It's not like she's levitating in the air and unleashing her full potential. If this is the kind of skill she can display in such a situation, then just imagine how badass it would be if she actually went full power on those jets. As I've said before, the X-Men franchise should have seriously considered continuing with Halle Berry for this role, but I guess they had other plans in mind. Please do something about her in the MCU X-Men. We're in top 10 territory now, so expect any bangers from this point forward. Now, I know I listed Voldemort's entry a bit earlier than this one, but that's only because it's somewhat expected of him to pull off ridiculous stunts like those. Professor McGonagall, however, is a more reserved character who's always held off on using her magic. Desperate times call for desperate measures, so she gave us a glimpse of her abilities by literally creating dozens of soldiers for the protection of Hogwarts. That muttered excitement while chanting the spell and the childish blush that followed was such an adorable moment. It was like a kid finally getting her hands on a Christmas present that was wrapped up for years. I've always wanted to use that spell. Also, let's give a round of applause to Maggie Smith because she was dealing with cancer treatment and she could barely move during this shoot. She only pushed through because she didn't want to disappoint the fans. Now, that's what I call a true hero. Hogwarts is threatened. Man the boundaries. Protect us. Do your duty to our school.
It's not often that you'll see a football scene this high up on the list, and that too without involving the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi. Shaolin Soccer is a movie that doesn't expect you to apply the common laws of physics and logic because its primary goal is entertainment. It's seen all throughout the movie, but the best possible display of power comes right at the very end when Shaolin teams face off against Team Evil in the final match. It was always a high stakes game, but the way Mui managed to control the energy of the ball towards the end was an S tier move. She didn't try to stop the ball or anything, she just controlled its energy. If that wasn't badass enough, Mui and Singh then combined their powers to unleash a devastating goal shot that not only won them the game, but also blew the opposition away, and I'm not just saying that for dramatic effect. Thanos is obviously a name that most people have come to fear, and that's because of his immense strength. I mean, this is the same guy who made the Hulk look like a puny fighter. However, his most definitive display of power was showed when he wiped half the universe out of existence. Of course, there's a lot more to this scene than just snapping his fingers in front of Thor. He did just defeat a whole bunch of Avengers without even breaking a sweat, and then he managed to survive a direct hit from Stormbreaker as well. Okay, I won't call it a direct hit because he would have lost his head if that happened. The impact of that one simple action was bigger than anything we've seen in a Marvel movie, so it's only fair to place the Mad Titan this high up on my list. You know, there's weight behind certain actions on film when they start to affect people in the real world as well. a power demonstration video if we don't have a Superman entry in it. I've covered the destruction of the world engine countless times before, but that's only because there's so much to say about it. This is the most beautiful scene in the entire film. It's the defining moment when Superman's will is tested, his strength is drained, and all seems so lost that humanity, as symbolized by Perry White and his people, hold on to each other as one last act of love before an inevitable fate. Superman looks so small and overwhelmed by this giant beam of a celestial force, which literally puts the weight of the world on his shoulders. He willingly accepts the pain to save us all and pulls out an inner strength where there was none. To top it off, the ascending notes of the achingly beautiful score pushing upwards in tandem with the scene is top-notch stuff. Man, I might be stretching it, but the whole sequence is so poetic that it feels like watching the birth of a god. You dye your meth with food color to make it look like mine already ate my product at every turn. I did mention earlier that power demonstrations aren't always meant to be extended bursts of energy or by overpowered punches and kicks. Sometimes it's just about showing people who the real boss is, and that's exactly what Walter White does here. To be able to stand tall and act so badass in front of an entire drug cartel can only come from a man who knows he's in charge. The audacity and dominance with which he orders Declan to say my name is exactly... Who the hell are you? You know. You all know exactly who I am. Say my name. Why this show is so respected even 10 years after its finale. I love how the show makes a drug dealer say the name of the world's greatest physicist with the same reverence that a physicist would. But seriously though, just look at how much pride Heisenberg has when he walks down to the cartel. I don't think bro was even this happy when his children were born. I'm the cook. I'm the man who killed Gus Fring. Bullshit. Father's given me strength. I always maintain that Thor's the strongest Avenger, and he's just fallen victim to lazy writers and inconvenient plot armor throughout his time in the MCU. Bro took on the full might of a collapsing star for crying out loud, and he didn't even have Mjolnir or Stormbreaker to help him out. You know what, I'm actually going to do the math here, so that we can end this conversation once and for all. So in cinematic time, Thor withstood the power of a neutron star for about 55 seconds before he collapses. I think it's fair to say that Captain Marvel would never be able to handle that kind of raw power and energy, because none of her opponents or enemies can even come close to that level. In the middle of this, he's also opening the Dyson Sphere, the weight of which is estimated to be around 10 to 25,000 tons, which you multiply by 200 billion to get the actual weight of what he's holding, because of the gravity of the neutron star. Hence, there's no doubt that the God of Thunder is the strongest Avenger in the MCU. If you saw 
watched Shaolin Soccer earlier, then seeing Kung Fu Hustle right now shouldn't come as much of a shock. This is another one of those movies where you need to leave your brain at home and only think with your heart. The final battle ending with the Buddhist palm finisher move was an amazing display from Singh, especially because of the way he builds into it. Bro literally jumped on top of an eagle to feel the power of the heavens and then launches his attack. It's hard to make a scene this entertaining even in today's world with access to better visual effects. If that wasn't enough, he flexed in front of the beast one more time just to show what he's capable of. Yeah, that's a true winner. First of all, let's raise our wands to Michael Gambon, who flawlessly played the role of Albus Dumbledore to the T. Rest in peace, sir. Now let's take a look at his most badass power demonstrations in the series. It's at the Dark Lake when all hope is lost and those zombie infery are all over Harry Potter and Dumbledore. Luckily, the Wizarding Supreme picks up his wand and literally roasts all the infery with a fire attack so deadly, even the dragons from Game of Thrones would have applauded his moves. The fact that he's weakened and injured only adds more weight to this flex. At first, it seems like Bro was telling Harry to call an ambulance, but then he picked up his wand and said, Not for me, though. Spider-Man always makes it to my list, and the train scene from the OG sequel is yet another example of an S-tier moment. I love this scene for three main reasons. The first, that Spider-Man was genuinely scared and panicking, but he was still willing to risk his own life and be nearly torn apart to save innocent people. The second is that it shows the perspective of the other people who tried to give back to Peter by lifting him back to safety and promising to keep his identity a secret. It's a great representation of how good acts inspire others to do the same. Finally, it shows that no matter how strong Spidey might be, he is still Peter Parker. He's a human and he has limits, but he's not afraid to test those limits for the sake of the greater good. And yes, the reason he's at number two is because it takes a heck of a lot of strength to be able to hold back a freaking train all by yourself. It's a special kind of power that allows you to outrun time itself. The Flash literally did this in the Snyder Cut, and it shows just how powerful he is if he uses it the right way. The Speed Force scene was an amazing addition to the film because it happens right after Flash witnesses the end of the world and realizes that he's the only one left to save it. Now, compare this to the theatrical release where his biggest contribution is saving a family in a car. Can you even imagine how people would have reacted if this version was released in the cinemas? Yet, yeah, this is exactly why I consider this scene to be the top entry on my list. Hope you like this video, please subscribe to the TV Region and here's another video I know you're going to enjoy.